Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. The Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, CJCA, in partnership with the Center for Educational Excellence in Alternative Settings, CEEAS, uh, is hosting two webinars offering practical advice on the guidance package released jointly by the U.S. Department of Justice and Education back on December 8th of 2014. Uh, today is, of course, the first of those two webinars, and today's focus is on the Department's five guiding principles for providing high-quality education in juvenile justice secure care settings. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by us here at CJCA, but it's going to be moderated by CEEAS staff who have also invited practitioners from around the country to present with them today. Thank you, everybody. We're really excited to offer this webinar with our friends at CJCA. Um, as he said, we're going to be offering highlights from the field today. Uh, we will be doing another one of these webinars in two weeks. We do have a number of guests. Uh, I'm on the line. I'm here with Christy Sampson Kelly, uh, who will be co-moderating with me. Christy has uh, a PhD from special education from the University of Maryland, spends most of her time providing direct support to principals and teachers in alternative settings. We also have Peter Leone joining us today, a professor from the University of Maryland School of Education, College of Education. We have Susan Burke, who's the director of Utah's Division of Juvenile Justice Services. We have Tim Lasante, who's the superintendent of District 79 in New York City. They provide educational programming inside of the schools at Rikers Island and other secure facilities in the city. We have Scott Smith, who's the director of education for the Missouri Division of Youth Services. And we have Roselle Bradley, principal of the Tanti High School, which is located in a facility, secure facility inside of Okeechobee, Florida. Before we get started, um, I just want to emphasize that we are not going to be summarizing the guiding principles document. It's incredibly clear and has its own executive summary. Instead, we'll be highlighting examples of juvenile justice agencies and their education partners who are working day to day to make these principles come alive in their agencies, facilities, and schools. We will provide samples, contact information, and a really great resource page. Every document that refer is referred to today during the webinar is available electronically on a resource page. But I'm now going to turn this over to Christy Sampson Kelly, who's going to get us started with the presentation around principle number one. Hello, everyone. We summarize this principle as creating enduring positive climates that make learning possible and see really three essential components of this to be authentic collaboration, meaningful, connected, and relevant educational experiences, and ensuring the right to learn for all students. We will first hear from Susan Burke on what the Utah Department of Juvenile Justice is doing along with its education partners, the local school districts, on this lever. Afterwards, I will also highlight good work coming out of Washington, D.C. and Indiana. Um, Susan, please offer us some examples of how Utah um, is collaborating to improve school climate in your facility. Thank you, Christy. I want to emphasize four different points in the next few minutes, and we're hopefully going to be visualizing those on the screen here. Um, the first point is we have a strong working relationship between our secure um, facility staff and our education staff. And we do this through a series of interagency agreements. In addition, our facility director, as part of his or her performance plan, is expected to work closely with the school and have regular meetings with the school. One example of that is every day we send information to the school so they know what their student had been doing the evening before in the residential unit. Uh, another thing that we do is we create authentic opportunities for both education staff and facility staff to work together on projects that have an educational component. And we recently completed a mural project through the Emanuel Project, and we had two exceptional murals produced in two different facilities. This happened during the school day. It became part of the education and art component. Students got up on ladders, they used tools, paints, they worked directly with um, Emmanuel Martinez, the artist who designed the murals, and um, teachers supported this particular effort along with our facility staff. The second way that we emphasize making school real is that we try and create opportunities that the students would have just in their home school environment. Um, one example of this is we sponsor InterSight Athletics. And so the different facilities are able to put together teams, and the teams play against each other. So there is travel between facilities. 
Um, the students have to meet a school code of conduct just like they would have to meet a school code of conduct at their own school, their public school. And they also have to meet GPA requirements. And so some of the things that we have seen come out of this particular project is students are motivated to learn. They're motivated to be part of the team environment. And they learn some really important life lessons. They learn how to cooperate together. They learn how to deal with disappointment and frustration. And they learn how to celebrate victories when they occur. The third area is that we have opportunities for schools to communicate with families. And we, some of our schools publish monthly newsletters that students actually author. And those newsletters are posted online, or they're also sent home, or they're hand-delivered when parents come to visit. One of our schools has a Twitter account. Another one is using a blog. And so there's constant communication between what's happening in the school um, and what's going on in the community that parents can tap into. And then the fourth area is that we increase visitation options for families. Um, we know how important it is to have families engaged and involved in supporting their child's education. So we have really um, changed how we go about visitation. We make sure that visitation is available every day of the week. We have certain times for visitation, but if that doesn't fit into the family schedule, we arrange for a different visitation time. We've also expanded the definition of family. Um, before, it used to be just mom and dad. Um, we've in included extended family. We've included close friends of the family if they are support and an important person in that young person's life. And we've also included the family dog and cat to come out for a visitation. We really want to create an environment where the student feels supported and that they have a positive environment for learning. Thank you, Susan. I'm now going to highlight two other examples. The first is Washington, D.C. The emphasis here is on creating meaningful, connected, and relevant educational experience for students. At the Maya Angelou Academy, in Washington, D.C., in partnership with D.C.'s Department of the Youth Rehabilitation Services, the school has a strong emphasis on academic projects that are culturally relevant, interdisciplinary, and build a range of skills. These also rely on the adults working with students in order for them to succeed. The model of instruction is built around such themes as relationships, power, choice, justice, freedom, and dreams. One example is the annual speech contest which occurs as part of the school-wide cross-curricular focus of power. Students study speeches and learn rhetorical devices, watch great speeches, and then write and perform their own speech. They, they practice in the school as well as their residential units and then compete in the school-wide contest held in the auditorium with all of the students gathered there along with visitors and outside judges to present. This contest is truly something to behold. I've been privileged to be a judge for the last two years, and both times I left changed by the young men who each discovered something of great power, their voice. One of my favorite lines from last year's speeches is this one. There are and will always be three types of people in the street, people who make it happen, people who watch it happen, and people that don't know what's happening. Well, that leads me to my next example from the field, and there are definitely some folks in Indiana who are making it happen. The last aspect of the first principle I'd like to talk about is creating an environment where all students have the right to learn. And for this one, I'll mention some of the great work that the Indiana Department of Corrections Division of Youth Services made over the last 18 months that we were fortunate enough to be a part of regarding the intentional evolution of the Behavioral Modification Unit to the current Making a Change Unit within Pendleton Juvenile Correctional Facility. Most notable was the change in philosophy and practice that resulted in the expectation being that all young people were to attend school regardless of their placement and separation. Progression through program levels on the MAC unit meant young people moved towards once again attending school with their peers in the main school. Doing this naturally reduced the numbers of students who needed to attend the school in classrooms on the MAC unit and facilitated the delivery of instruction to students attending school on that unit daily for six hours per day just like their peers. Further, it meant that students were provided with relevant, aligned instruction, including necessary special education services per, per IEP plans. And that allowed them to keep pace with their studies. Young people who used to stay isolated in their cells most of the day are now attending school and other programs on a regular basis and regularly, regularly interacting with peers and staff. This model is one that's being used to reduce and ultimately bring a necessary end to the use of isolation. 
At this point, we're going to hear from David, who will discuss principle two. On we are now on board with principle number two. It's not all about the money, but money sure does matter. So um, the guidance is pretty clear here. We need to have uh, enough funding to support quality educational opportunities for all. Our belief is that statewide per pupil funding formulas should always serve as the starting point as we think about providing the right type of educational resources to make these schools work. We're going to address how three states address this principle. I'm going to cover two of them, then I'm going to turn it over to Scott Smith, who's going to talk about Missouri. So the first one we're going to talk about is the state of Oregon. And hold on to your seats, everybody. In Oregon, um, which is the case in about half of the states in the country, local school districts run the schools inside of the state secure agencies, not the state agency itself. But in Oregon, under state law, there is specific language in the state code that allocates funding to the state office of education to fund these schools. And that rate is equal to, yes, two times the statewide per pupil average. And why does that multiple exist? Well, if you go back to when they first put it in, it exists to ensure that the schools selected by the state offices of education, school districts, have the resources they need to meet the needs of the schools in the OJA facilities. Many other states have weighted school funding formulas that do provide multiples for students in alternative settings. And we believe that all states should attempt to derive formulas that use state per pupil funding formulas and appropriate multiples to ensure pop proper educational funding. The next state we're going to talk about is Indiana. In Indiana, as we just indi Indiana runs its own schools. So the Division of Youth Services within the Department of Corrections has its own education division. And as most of you know, this is the case in about half of the states in the country as well. Historically, IDOJC has not had any set formula to determine the appropriate amount of funding it needs in order to meet the needs of its students. Instead, they fund the educational program from agency operating funds on an annual basis. And that's always been difficult and tricky and means quality educational services depend year to year on, state, on agency operating budgets. But right now, under the leadership of Susan Lockwood, they are engaged in the process of calculating how much funding they should be getting if the state funded their schools using the per pupil state funding formula with the appropriate weights with the goal of developing at some point a legislative mandate that would ensure that their department has appropriate and equitable educational funding. And we strongly advocate that for state juvenile justice agencies that run their own educational program, that they go through a similar process and ultimately get a legislative mandate that their school, that their educational program is funded on par with and equitably with other schools in the state. We're now going to turn this over to Scott Smith, who's going to talk about some, a unique way that Missouri works with this. Thanks, David. In Missouri, we're an accredited Missouri Public School District. Um, and our education programs are mostly financially self-sufficient, mainly because we bill back local school districts for their local pro property tax on students who are referred by the juvenile courts to our system. This is a long-standing state statute that any state agency can bill back local schools. And if you think about it, it's only fair. Why should a local school district keep their local tax funding for education for a child when they've been referred to another entity for education? We also receive state appropriation for students based on hours attendance. We receive classroom trust funds, the gambling funds that are distributed at every school. We receive Proposition C funds, which is a tax for education in Missouri. We receive federal funds, Title I Special Ed, Carl Perkins. So we have a steady funding flow into our school district, which really helps our education program. Plus, it gives incentives to the local school district to keep their kids, not suspend them, because if they do and they get referred in the Missouri Division of Youth Services, they actually lose money, not only their local tax money, but their state money because they're on our rolls. Scott, terrific. Thank you for summarizing that. Again, we want to emphasize equitable funding, funding that will meet the needs of all students, 
and funding that is on par and relative to other funding formulas for other students in the state. Um, we're now going to move on to principle number three. And we've summarized this one as getting the best teachers in front of the kids who need them the most. How do you get teachers who are fully committed to your students' success? Well, through robust recruiting strategies, ongoing commitment to train, evaluate, and hold teachers accountable, and by compensating them fairly. We're going to be highlighting three states or agencies that are tackling this long-standing difficult issue. The Indiana Department of Corrections, the Missouri Division of Youth Services, and New York's District 79. I will summarize what's going on in Indiana, and then Scott and Tim will talk about what's, what they're doing in Missouri and New York. So in Indiana, on teacher recruiting, although they are local state, Susan has done a terrific job of reaching out to local universities and colleges and establishing strong relationships to the teacher pipeline. There's no reason why enthusiastic, well-trained teachers shouldn't be considering coming to work in our youth correctional setting. They can be terrific places to work with small student-teacher ratios and lots of autonomy. At the same time, teacher student is reaching out nationwide using online tools and other resources to get the best teachers in the country to come work with her kids who she knows needs the best teachers. Secondly, training and evaluation. Although the state agency run the runs the schools, the teachers in her in Indiana's facilities are evaluated using the statewide teacher evaluation tool called RISE. We think this is critically important. Teachers need training and support. They also need clear evaluation standards. And for state juvenile justice agencies who are not part of local school districts, we must find ways to ensure that there are a fair and systematic ways to train, evaluate, and hold teachers accountable. Second thing that they do in Indiana is they have school report cards. These report cards um, summarize key student performance indicators on behavior and academic targets. They are produced quarterly. And the superintendent of schools, Susan, meets with her principals who meet with teachers on a regular basis to alter and amend instruction so that students will continue to learn and to increase achievement. These school report cards have been essential in helping teachers and principals feel more empowered and more accountable to help all of the students in their facilities meet their academic and behavioral um, possibilities. Thirdly, compensation is tricky, and in, in, in Indiana, teacher pay in, is comparable but not exact with local school districts. We're now going to move on to hear from Scott. Uh, in Missouri, I'm going to start backwards and start with the worst and maybe go to the best. In Missouri, our teachers are state-level employees. They're paid less than their district peers. They work in a year-round school and have state benefits. Missouri ranks 50th in state worker pay. So it's a constant issue with the state of Missouri. And what we try to do is we expand our recruiting across the entire state. We emphasize internal promotion of our youth specialists who work in the classroom behavior management into teaching credentials. We reimburse teachers 100% for pursuing their special ed certification. Right now, 100% of our teachers are Missouri Certificate At-Risk Instructors, and 60% have their special ed certification. We have professional learning communities in each of our regions. Our teachers are evaluating our state merit employee evaluation system, but it's very flexible. We're able to add an educational evaluation supplement to it. The people who evaluate our teachers are not educators. They are uh, juvenile justice and uh, social work people who work within the facility as facility managers. But we have regional education consultants that provide um, and implement the educational performance objectives in their evaluation and provide co consultation to the teachers and to each facility. Uh, we are an accredited school district. We have 46 through 12 high schools. And within those high schools are one to four groups of 10 to 13 kids. So our class size is very small, which can be an incentive for teachers to stay in our system. So in our, in our particular scenario, retention is very important and recruitment we're constantly working on. 
Thank you, Scott. Um, let's hear from Tim Lasante, who is the superintendent of District 79. District 79 runs the schools inside of the secure facilities in New York City, including the schools on Rikers Island. Tim, Tim, are you there? Have you been disconnected? Hi, I'm, uh, thank you, David. Uh, as you said, we, we're part of the New York City public school system, and we have two schools. One is called Passages Academy, serving students that are 15 and younger in secure detention. And then on Rikers Island, students that are 16 to 21 are in a school called East River Academy. And there's advantages of being part of a large school system, and one is that we have access to the Office of uh, Recruitment uh, that uh, constantly goes out to the universities and tries to get new teachers to come into the system. And we're continuously recruiting for these two schools. Uh, and the second big advantage we have is something called open market. Um, our principals can post in April their anticipated vacancies in these two schools uh, for September. And tenured teachers can transfer in. And we really go after tenured teachers because we feel that in order to modify and adapt a curriculum, in a, a short-term setting like detention, uh, it's always good if you have, have some expertise in, in teaching that curriculum and experience. Um, so our teachers have the same uh, requirements as far as licensing as uh, any high school teacher. The challenge that we have, especially in passages, is that 54% of the students have disabilities and 25% are middle school students meaning there's a different license to teach middle school versus high school. So the other thing that we always look for are dual certified teachers. Um, a special ed math combination is like goal, uh, very hard to find. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, 2013, uh, New York City accepted Race to the Top money, and we have now a new uh, teacher and principal evaluation system for the last two years. And we're very thankful that our teachers were not exempt from this, um, even though the union wanted uh, the teachers in security detention to be exempt. Um, and so we're in the same uh, rating system, evaluation system, as any other teacher. And the design right now is that teachers pick, um, and they get between four, a minimum of four to six uh, uh, written feedback on observations. Those observations are based in the Danielson framework. Uh, the union and the uh, uh, Board of Ed uh, focused on eight different domains of Danielson. So <clears throat> within these observations, principals must rate each teacher on each domain throughout the school year. It gets weighted, and that becomes 60% of the teacher's um, uh, final evaluation. 40% is based on state assessments. Uh, this week we're giving what's known as Regents exams because this is the end of the semester. Uh, we give them again in June. Um, and what happens is uh, uh, they look at the school's performance on the Regents, students' performance on the Regents for the last two years. And uh, if you fall within that range, you get 40% or 30% uh, of your grade depending on how well the students do. So 40% is based on state assessments, and 60% are based on uh, the teacher uh, uh, evaluation. And um, unfortunately, our teachers don't make any additional money. The only thing that we can offer them, and this is something that Peter Leone helped us with a long time ago, is we got uh, uh, loan forgiveness for our teachers that have uh, outstanding loans because it's a hard-to-staff school. Uh, so uh, we really think this, what they call the advanced system of teacher evaluation, really has helped improve the quality of delivery of services and secure detention. Thanks, Tim. Again, to summarize this point, recruiting is critical, finding ways to make sure that your teachers are trained, supported, and evaluated and held accountable is absolutely essential. Regardless of how you're structured, if you are a state agency that hires your own teachers, we would 
strongly encourage you to look at the statewide teacher evaluation tools as examples to how to find ways to support, train, and hold teachers accountable. Um, if you are a school district that runs the schools for a state agency, we would absolutely urge the school districts to hold teachers in these facilities to the exact same standards that you would hold teachers to in the community in suburban school districts. And if you are a state agency where school districts provide the educational coverage, it is essential that you lean on your school district partners and make sure that you understand their teacher evaluation process. And if you feel as the teachers are not being held to high standards, that as the head of the youth correctional agency, you take responsibility for reaching out to the district leadership to have candid, transparent conversations about the quality of educational programming school districts are providing. I'll turn it over to Christy. Thanks, David. We're now going to move on to principle number four. And we summarize this principle as rethinking student-centered instruction. We'll highlight two examples for this principle. Peter Leone will first discuss the work done at Challenger Youth Camp in Los Angeles. And Roselle Bradley will highlight the work at her school in Okeechobee, Florida. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. OK, thank you, Christy. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that's being done at Challenger Mumblefield Youth Center, where the Krista McCullough High School, which is operated by the Los Angeles County Office of Education, um, provides services to the youth. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, Superintendent Delgado from LACO um, has uh, developed with his staff, Diana Velasquez and others, something called the Road to Success Academy. Um, it has a strong emphasis on project-based learning. Um, academic work is centered around themes that include identity, perseverance, and transformation. Um, the schools also uh, have a strong emphasis on literacy and have developed some, some terrific career and technical education um, options and vocational opportunities. Um, at Challenger, over the last couple of years, I've seen some tremendous changes that affect school culture and that have really engaged students in, in very novel kind of ways. So what I'd like to do is, is highlight one particular project that I had the chance to see last month. Um, this, is a, this is a mural created by uh, students in the building construction um, class along with um, the language arts class. Um, they decided to create a 1960s style art piece with an overarching theme of identity. The students studied the artists from the 60s, 60s and settled on Andy Warhol and Jonathan uh, Borofsky, um, two uh, well-known artists that used both re repetition and bright colors and, and Borofsky in particular used silhouettes. So the students had to design the piece. They had with the hand and power tools. Um, they, they did that after completing an OSHA 10 um, construction industry safety training. Um, uh, they, they, uh, they did research on the artists in, in developing this. Um, they had to sand, paint, um, place the images on, uh, on the board. And as you can see, it's a, it's a really uh, terrific, uh, I think, representation. You kind of, if you go left from right, you can see the ways in which the students have envisioned their transformation as from incarcerated individuals to individuals who are kind of pondering their future, perhaps as students to graduates, and then to members of, of the community. Uh, again, uh, I, I just, it just kind of jumps out at you when you see it. And um, the school has uh, plans to um, create a frame and, and mount it on plexiglass. And, uh, and it's, it's a couple of, uh, of creative teachers, Judy Warner and uh, Amy Nobles um, at Challenger, that are largely responsible for, for nurturing the students in the development of this. Thank you, Peter. And now we're going to hear from Roselle Bradley um, regarding project-based learning in her school in Okeechobee, Florida. Thank you, Kristen. Hello, everybody. My school is one of four schools within secure facilities in Okeechobee, Florida that formed the Okeechobee Network. Basically, this is, became a working group composed of school leadership and teachers working together along to increase student engagement, promote critical thinking and rigorous learning, and to help move away from classes revolving around direct instruction 
handouts and worksheets. So we collectively agreed to develop a one-week project-based learning module around the theme of how can I impact my community. All of the subject area teachers at all decide to use that theme to support a week-long exploration culminating in student presentations. So I'm just going to touch on some of the scholar perspectives, the teacher perspective, and the secure staff perspective. C has provided each site with a video presentation to introduce the students to PBL and what it stands for. And the majority of students were excited to take on a new challenge. We did have a few students who refused to initially participate because they wanted to do the book work. But these students later changed their minds when they saw that the participating students were having a good time working on their selected projects. The students later reported that the best part for them of the PBL was when they were able to share their projects with the Director of Education for DJJ, Ms. Julie Orange, the CS representative, Dr. Lynette Tannis, and the Deputy Superintendent for G4S Schools, Dr. John Zuli. The students did an impressive job of presenting their projects and answering questions. The students did report that at times it felt overwhelming to them since they had to do a project in all five of their subjects. So the solution to that we determined would be to do a PBL in only one subject at a time. The teacher perspective, it was met with some resistance from some teachers. And the reasons that I found for the resistance was that the teachers were under the impression that it will increase their workload in regards to planning and developing lesson plans. At the end of the day, after consultation with CS, this was not the case. It actually made their task easier, and once the lesson planning was completed, it was all on the students. The teachers also felt that they have already incorporated PBL in their lessons, but this did not go all the way to a PBL since the students weren't able to select how they would present their projects and show mastery of the concepts that, would that the teachers were teaching them. Um, the solutions to some of the resistance, um, we had meetings with the teachers to review the PBL concepts and the training provided by CS. We also had discussions of using the lesson plans provided by CS, which made it a lot easier since it outlined the standards, the objectives, accommodations, rubric, hook, lesson, and closing. So all the teachers had to do was input the information that they would have put on their original lesson plans. Every one of the teachers and lead educators at the site registered on Edmodo, where we received the support from three other DJJ sites in our area, CS and Ms. Julie Orange. We also conducted a video chat session, session with a CS representative who addressed all of the complaints and concerns and clarified any misunderstandings that we had about the PBL project. We also stayed in touch through emails and telephone and with our counterparts in the district. The lead teachers also participated in conference calls with CS representatives. The secure staff, they loved it. They felt that they were more involved in the classroom. They were able to move around more freely. They were able to assist the students with giving feedback on their project, assisting them when they needed um, supplies. So they really, really enjoyed the project. And we did not have any behavior problems during the week of the PBL. So that really kept the students engaged and focused on the task at hand. So we've met since it was such a success. I've met with the facility administrator, where we reviewed the survey results conducted by CS. And the students were actually asking for more projects. So we decided that each month, starting this January, that we will have a week of PBL with a central theme, which makes it a little easier for the students to stay focused and they don't have to jump from one theme to another. Um, for January, we have selected nutrition, and the teachers are addressing all aspects of nutrition from their perspective subjects. Every class I've visited have students who can report on what they are learning and how they are shocked at what seems to be healthy foods are really not that healthy once you read the nutritional, nutritional information. And in math, they are telling me that they are learning to calculate BMR. In science, they are learning about agriculture and pesticides. And in reading, they are comparing and contrasting nutritional information on products such as cereal. 
vocational classes they are learning about the training education requirements and salaries of the different careers such as the chef marketing consultants and the students are also using the lab time to use publisher and work word to make flyers for their restaurants or a PowerPoint presentation of the different careers where the culinary arts students are baking cookies using some more healthy ingredients versus the more unhealthy ones such as brown sugar and regular sugar. And then they will end it with a comparison between the two and calculating the calories of the two groups. So I love the PBL, the students love it, and the secure style love it, love it because it keeps the students more engaged. They are excited about the learning process, and I believe that they are learning a whole lot more with a hands-on project than they are with just direct instruction. So at the end of the day, I'm proud of the sense of accomplishment that it gives the students to show off what they are actually learning. Thank you, Christy. Peter Rosell, thanks very much for, for uh, giving us some great examples of, of how to make uh, teaching and learning more relevant and uh, student-centered. Uh, the last principle, principle number five, we're calling uh, breaking through the silos, making systems work for kids in transition. There are some pretty obvious keys here that are outlined. Reentry planning must begin upon arrival. Juvenile justice agencies, school districts, support teams, other state agencies, and importantly, families and the kids themselves must all be actively involved in the transition process. Wraparound support needs to be in place prior to kids getting uh, being released to the community. We're going to highlight what two states are doing on this issue, Florida and New York City. I'm going to talk about Florida, and then we'll have Tim Lasante join us again for New York. In Florida, Florida's recent law, um, which again is attached on the resource page, statute 1003.5210, um, might just serve as a model that we all want to get through our legislature. Passed through at the state level, the law requires transition planning to start at the time youth enter the JJ's facility. It requires the development of an individualized um, transition plan. That plan must be developed collaboratively by a team that includes this juvenile justice agency representatives, people from the local school districts, people from the school district in the eight where, where the facility is located. It includes fam must include family members and other supports. It actually lays out and requires mandatory meetings that must be um, coordinated by the Department of Probation prior to school release. Importantly, it prohibits school districts from what has been a much too standard practice in Florida and elsewhere for automatically placing students in mandatory alternative schools. Instead, student placement must be done on an individualized basis. Um, again, that law uh, is available in the resource page. It's only recently going to, gone through the legislature, but I know uh, the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice is really excited to see that it went through and is excited to start seeing how they can support its implementation at the local level. Tim Lasante is now going to talk to us a little bit about what they're doing on this principle in New York. Uh, thank you, Davey. Uh, last year, 618 different schools sent students into our security detention schools, 618 different schools from all over New York City. So one of the, the best things that we had got, gotten accomplished uh, probably about 10 years ago is the chances regulation stating that the students who are sent into detention have the automatic right to return to their home school. It's called homeschool reentry uh, if they've been to that school within the last year. It's a one-year uh, time limit. Uh, because before that, what happened was students would go into detention, uh, sometimes it was just a few days until the next court date, but they were discharged from their home school and had to fight their way back in. So homeschool reentry is a policy that really helped us in the reentry uh, of students. Uh, our goal now is to make sure that all information is e electronically transferred back to the home school and the school districts. Uh, how we, we do that in two different ways. One is all the transcripts, uh, the credits that are earned at Passage Academy. 
Uh, we have six-week uh, uh, cycles where students can earn credits every six weeks. It goes right onto this uh, student transcript, which is a New York City transcript. This way, when they go back to school, the home school can pull it up, and there's no haggling about you know the coursework that was done uh, in detention. So uh, that was a big win, uh, uh, getting the credits uh, right onto the transcript. And what we've done recently in the last two or, or three years is we invested in a, a platform called Plan to Succeed, which you see on the screen. Uh, every student who comes into juvenile detention, day one, when transitional planning starts, uh, gets an account and, and a password, and they build their transitional plan. It's student-driven. And one of the first things we put on there is who's your primary support at home? Is it your mother, your father, your aunt, your uncle, your brother? Uh, and we also put in the counselor and the counselor, our counselor's phone number and email and also probation officer if that's an, another person. And all, so all the contacts with the student's primary network are in this right away. This way, if the stu student gets discharged his next court date, he knows who to contact or, uh, uh, or if his transition back home doesn't work. Um, so I think those are some of the things. Um, this particular platform we invested in, we, we, we got the whole vote. What happens in this is there's a career exploration piece. Uh, there's resume writing tutorials. So they can upload their uh, resumes into this plan. And the key thing is they can be accessed as kids spiral through the system. We have a lot of movement. We have eight different sites and passages. Students move a lot. If they get placed, they move to another spot. But uh, like because they have access to it through their password and their account, they can access this at any one of the sites or uh, when they go home or in, in their home school. And the other thing I want to emphasize on these uh, collaborations and reentry and, and, and our work is um, the partnership agreements that we've developed over the years. So before we uh, embed teachers into these uh, sites, any sites, we sit with the agency and we uh, come up with a, a, a partnership agreement. That was, um, we used to call it MOU, but then the lawyers got involved, so we, we stopped doing that. It's just basically uh, we're going to make our best efforts to do this, and you're going to do this. Uh, things like timely uh, delivery of students to, to school, we, we're fighting that in some places. Uh, so um, we we have and I and we have I gave some samples of the partnership agreements and also the plan to succeed, which is uh, on the resource page at at uh, at the end. And part of the partnership agreement is that there must be monthly meetings and they must be data driven. So we have a dashboard and we go over site by site. Uh, you know, how many incidents took place, how, how many students are in credits that cycle, uh, how many passed to regions and, and, and things like that. So uh, one of the things we insist on are monthly uh, meetings of all the uh, supervisors and, and uh, the data dashboards are key because we want that to drive the discussions. Thank you, Tim, for sharing that information with us. Um, we're going to uh, start to wrap up. Um, so in closing, um, uh, we, one, we want to summarize this by saying that really clear, well-articulated policies um, can set the foundation for strong, healthy, student-centered relationships to develop between teachers and secure care staff, between principals and facility administrators, between school district leadership and state agency directors, and between students and families and the people who are, um, for whom we are trusted to care for them while they are in secure settings. And it's both of these together that make this work. Really clear, articulated policies and agreements, and then thoughtful adults who work together on behalf of their students to make the memoranda and the policies come to life on behalf of the children they serve. And that's what we've tried to focus on here is both the people side of this and the policy side of this. Before we go to the resource page, one other critical component that we would like to emphasize, particularly for states that run their own education division is that we can't just forever say this is how it's been done and we can't address it. If you run a state
state juvenile justice agency and your teachers are chronically undercompensated, then you will chronically have turnover, you will chronically have underperforming teachers, and your students will forever not get the educational services they need, deserve, and are entitled to. Fixing that is difficult. It may require going all the way up to the state legislature. It may require changing your state code so you can have a different employee class so that teachers can be paid comparably with their district peers. That's just an example. All through this process, both school districts and juvenile justice agencies have opportunities to take bold stands and change the way you work day to day on behalf of the children in your care. And the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Justice have done their part in laying that out, we believe, by sorting that in five clear principles. We're now going to quickly take a look at the resource page. I want to thank Susan Burke. I want to thank Roselle, Tim Lasante, Scott Smith, and Peter Leone for joining Christy and me. I think we'll have some time for calls, but Christy's going to show you how the resource page will work just for a moment. Very quickly, um, we have also provided some re webinar resources. Um, if you click on each of the principles, you'll see that examples of what was presented today are there. So for this principle that we just heard about, the Florida statute is there. If you click on that icon, there's a link that leads you directly to that. And also, um, Tim Lasanti in New York has been gracious enough to provide us with a password. Um, to go ahead and check out New York City's um, plan, to, plan to Succeed website. And that will all be made available to you. So the resource page will be on the CJCA website as well as, well as our website. Uh, to the extent we could, every document mentioned, every policy mentioned, every statute mentioned is available electronically through a live link. That concludes our presentation. I think we may have a few minutes for questions. Um, if anybody has any, I think if you send them in through the chat, Brenda can help us on that. Great. And thanks, David, and thanks to all our panelists here today. We got some great praise on some of the programs that you guys showed us here. So I'm very thankful for that. And us here at CJCA, thank you all for presenting. Uh, just a reminder that if you're typing in your questions, and I do have a few that I'm going to try and get to before we wrap up, but if you're typing them in, make sure you type them in on the control panel for the webinar. And uh, if you're trying to direct your question to any one of our panelists in particular, just make sure you specify so, and I can uh, try and direct those questions accord accordingly. <clears throat> so while you guys are typing in those, I want to get to one of the questions that came in much earlier when we were talking about Principle 1. And uh, it has to do with getting some buy-in around Principle 1. Uh, the principle was creating enduring positive climates that can make learning possible. So I was wondering, David, maybe if you could talk a little bit about getting buy-in from all the stakeholders and what the process was like there. Um, again, if the question concerns getting buy-in from teachers, secure care staff, adults in the room, I think part of this is you have to take a leap of faith. Adults want um, kids to succeed. Adults working in secure care facilities are almost always there for the right reason. We need to give them the tools and we need to give them um, steps to take so that the learning environment will be one that's positive and uplifting and engaging. And part of this is you just have to believe. If you give students some choice, if you give students some autonomy, if you directly reach out to their cre the best of their creativity and create meaningful, engaging academic activities that empower and make it uh, important that secure care and teaching staff work together with kids, it almost always goes better. But somehow you just got to get that ball rolling. That's the best I can tell you. Facilities all around the country, people tell us, you can't ever put 20 kids in a room together because they're just going to be mad brawls. We can't ever do a student assembly because they can't get along. All that we can tell you is from a lot of the states that we work in, people are trying those things. They're trying, if you can't put, a, okay, don't put 100 kids in the auditorium, but put 30 and run a poetry contest and set up good procedures in advance. And you'd be shocked how supportive the kids will be of each other's poems how supportive secure care staff will be to see their kids up there expressing themselves doing well. So part of it is you just got to believe. You got to put tools out there, know that it will appeal to the better angels inside of all of us, 
and know that ultimately all kids want to be in a school that's safe and inspiring, and adults want to work in schools that are interesting and engaging. Well, thank you. And I think while we've got our panelists on the line, I want to make sure I can get a question over to them. So I've got something here that I think I want to run by Tim, and maybe we can get Scott in here as well, because uh, it came in while we were talking about principle three. And Tim, you were talking about uh, continually recruiting and uh, got a couple questions about turnover. Do you feel like you've got a high rate of turnover? And if you do, where, where are they going to? Are they going uh, to other districts? Can you talk a little bit about your turnover? Yes, uh, a couple of years ago we did a retention study um, and it was very similar to the rest of the city, but, but the, the retention rate in the city is not that good. We have teachers leaving, uh, and that's one of the UFT, the, the union's uh, goals for this year is to uh, increase the uh, retention of, of teachers. The challenge that we have is that we, we hire a lot of new teachers, and they kind of get their foot in the door with us, and once they get tenure, which is three years, they kind of then now are free agents and can go into open market and and leave and, and a lot of times they leave and not necessarily because uh, uh, the conditions are bad it's just that logistically especially Rikers Island it's a nightmare to get in and out of it it takes you a half an hour to get to your classroom you know once you get on the island sometimes so our retention is about the same as it is in New York which is which is low it's not that uh, different than anybody else, but uh, we have a real challenge in, in trying to keep uh, folks uh, to be career educators in, in, in uh, juvenile detention. And how about uh, Missouri, Scott? You guys have a high rate of turnover with your teachers, would you say? Well, normally we would. Right now there's abundance of teachers in the state of Missouri, so getting a teaching job in the state is, is an issue whether you're in youth services trying to get out and make more money or you're out just graduating from school. But we try to tap into a group of educators sometimes that people forget about and that's our retired teachers in the state of Missouri. Uh, most in, in the state of Missouri this, the public school retirement system is non-social security based so many people re will retire after 25 years at age 47 they still got a good number of years left that they could teach and we try to recruit those through our uh, state a retired teacher association and many teachers even retire in Missouri when they're after 30 years and they want to build up their social security and our state system we try to recruit the, that particular group of teachers too so that's just an area that I think people forget about sometimes that retired public school teachers can make very good juvenile detention teachers Thank you both, and it's uh, it's about three o'clock on the dock here, which is our scheduled end time. So I just want to again thank all all of our panelists and of course the staff over at CEAS uh, for putting together this presentation. Want to remind you all that we will be making everything available. Uh, we'll do a follow up email to everybody that attended here. Uh, also, those who registered, we'll make sure that we send a follow up email to you. Um, Anything else that you have questions on, you can always reach out to CJCA and the CJCA website. Please visit CJCA and the CJCA blog uh, for information, and also you can reach us on any of your favorite various social media networks. Uh, this, again, is the first of two webinars on the topic, so we'll also send out follow-up information on how to register for the next webinar, which is currently scheduled for February 12th at the same time, 2 o'clock Eastern. And I hope to see you all then. So on behalf of our panelists today, thank you again for attending, and have a great day and a great afternoon.